I've been in the financial services technology world for about 20 years. Um, I joined DST Global Solutions about a year ago to run the uh, data management analytics line of business. It's a big focus for us and Nova is the main product in that area. In terms of today, what I wanted to talk a little bit about was uh, a data-driven business is. What is a data-driven business? Look at a case study from a completely different industry. Are the things that firms in, uh, in other industries are, are doing with data that we can learn from in the, in the wealth industry? And then look at what a data-driven wealth management organization might look like and what would it be capable of? What is a data-driven business? Well, all businesses generate data and, and use data to, to some extent, but a data-driven business is, is obsessive about data, about, about collecting data, about analyzing data, and about using objective, concrete data to drive their decision-making. And importantly, a data-driven business sets targets and measures performance based on that data, and they create a feedback loop. So they're obsessive about measuring everything, measuring the impact of change, and optimizing change to improve the business. And interestingly, when you look at a, um, the successful data-driven businesses, it's not just about the data, it's about the insights that they generate from that data that's clearly important. And they put the client absolutely at the heart of everything they do. I think that's hugely relevant for the, for the wealth management industry. Many firms evolving perhaps from more product-centric to being uh, a, a truly client-centric organizations. In the online world, the likes of Google, Amazon, and Facebook are all obsessive about gathering large quantities of data about their customers, about the environment, and using that data in innovative ways to, to drive their business. It's actually an example from the, uh, from the offline world, the bricks and mortar world of supermarket retailing that, that I wanted to look at in a bit more detail. Tesco is a global supermarket uh, retailer headquarters in the UK. And their, their, their journey to becoming a, a data-driven business began back in the mid-90s. Supermarket retailing is a phenomenally competitive environment and they realized that improving customer loyalty was absolutely key to their success. And they had the vision to realize that gaining a much deeper understanding of their customer would enable them to improve uh, that, or increase customer loyalty. And they realized that gathering data about their customers would enable them to do that. So they began working with a, with a data analytics company, a firm called Dunhumby, and that led to the introduction of the, of the Tesco loyalty card. Unlike most wealth management firms, Tesco really didn't really have data about their customer behavior, their customer inter interactions at that point. Our introduction of the loyalty card allowed them to gather vast uh, quantities of data about their customers, about their customers' buying behavior. And they, they used that data to drive much greater understanding, deep analytic techniques to, to, uh, to un understand their customer and use that to, to drive increase in customer loyalty. And it was very successful. In a t over a 10-year period, they grew their revenues from about $8 billion to, to $30 billion. In a, in a very competitive environment, they, uh, they grew their market share by over 10%. As, they, as the saying goes, they liked it so much that they bought the company. They actually uh, they bought the analytics uh, consultancy they were working with. And Tesco now offer advice to firms wanting, wanting to do this. And they're moving into the financial, so well, they have moved into the financial services world. This philosophy is, is absolutely uh, w with us in, in, in our industry today. Look a little, in a little bit more detail about what they did. As I said, customer, customer segmentation w w was, was key. They gathered vast quantities of data and they, they used some fairly sophisticated analytic techniques to, to mine that data and to look at the uh, correlations in terms of different, pro different products that, that customers were buying. They, they segmented the customer base into about 25 different lifestyle segments based on buying behavior. And they, they identify segments like, for example, maybe value conscious families or eco warriors, customers with a propensity to, to buy uh, in, environmentally uh, uh, friendly products and that uh, that client segmentation allowed them to target their customers in a very targeted and relevant way so they could offer incentives to customers that were directly relevant to the, to the things that those particular customers w were interested in so to personalizing the experience using the data is a key aspect i think of, uh, of data-driven businesses as i said change measurement they, they, they measured the change every change they made and looked at the effectiveness of that so for example as they they moved the, the positions of a product within the store, moved a, a product up to eye level where it's more attractive. They were able to measure the impact of doing that or, or to the, the end of rows, which is, is, the, is the prime position, I'm, I'm told, in the, in the supermarket world. They could measure the impact of that on the product profitability and on, on, the, on, the, uh, on the store profitability. Product supplier feedback, again, hugely relevant, I think, for the wealth industry. Um, so the, the learnings that Tesco gained from all this uh, data that they gathered and the, the insights that they generated, they shared those with their suppliers and that enabled their suppliers to develop products that were better targeted at the, at the customer base. Real-time environment monitoring. So Tesco even went to the, to the extent of, of monitoring things like the weather 
and dashboards with looking at the weather in different regions and in different stores and we're able to do things like op optimize the stock according to what the weather was forecast to be in, in those areas. In the wealth world, perhaps it's the uh, financial market environment rather than the weather environment that, that's more relevant, but, but, but the concept's absolutely the same. As I said, the customer was absolutely the heart of what they were doing. Lord McLaurin, who's the Tesco chairman at the time, said after three months of working with Dunhumby, they, they knew more about his customers than, than he did after 30 years in the business. They put customer at the heart of it. They gathered a large quantity of data, not just about the customers, about the products, about the external environment, and they used that to generate actionable insights. They used the data to personalize the client experience, to provide targeted offers and incentives that were directly relevant to, to specific customer groups. They changed the organization on the basis of these insights and they measured the impact of that change and it and evolved and con continually improved. And as I said, it was phenomenally successful. So what would a uh, data-driven wealth management business look like? Well, I think there are probably three different flavors of insight that a, a wealth management business might want to generate. Insights directed straight to the, the end client. Insights that might improve the, the, the client's user experience, optimize their, their, their investment behavior. Then there are insights directed towards the relationship manager. I think it, it came up on the panel. Anything that will help the, the relationship manager deepen that, that, uh, that client relationship. And then insights directed towards the, the enterprise. How do, we, how do we run the business more effectively as a whole? And there may be some differences between private banking and the, and the mass affluent world, but I think the, the fundamental principles and concepts are, are absolutely similar. And even within those, those different sectors, different customers will have different preferences about how they wish to be served and engaged with. And, and so flexibility is key. As we talked about, personalization is, is fundamental. A one-size-fits-all uh, offering is not the answer here. I think there are really four steps to becoming a, a data-driven wealth management. Firstly, it's about generating the data, and it's about aggregating that data, bringing it together so we can make sense of it and do something with it. And it's about generating insights from that data. And lastly, it's about distributing those insights. I don't think we're in a bad place. A lot of the building blocks are already in place to do this. Probably about taking things to the next level. A lot of the data is already there. We've got data about customers. We've got profiling data. We've got product data. We've got pricing data, transaction data, position data. A lot of that data is, is time series data. So we've got a lot of it. And we've got going back in time. We've got data about our clients' investment goals. That's hugely valuable. We, we have information about our clients' wants and needs. That was the holy grail for Tesco, really, to, to try and imply that from clients' uh, buying behavior. But in the wealth world, we have some of this al already today. Vast quantities of analytic data, performance data, risk, risk information. Things like competitor activity, external events, marketing activity. Maybe that's uh, data that, that's less easily, less easily available and, and, and you know, firms will, will need to make decisions around how much of that data they need to, to go out and acquire. And there is a, there's, a, you know, there's a cost and a value to, uh, well, a value to data and a cost to, uh, to acquiring and, and storing it. And you know, clearly data that's, that's high value and, and low cost, uh, so top right on this, uh, in this matrix, is, uh, is great. That's, that's the stuff we want. And you know, firms will, will sort of need to make a judgment call about how far along the, uh, you know, where the cutoff line for them is in terms of uh, the trade-off between uh, cost and value. And that'll be different for different firms. It, it may well change over time. And things like investment in technology infrastructure will drive changes in the cost of acquisition and storage. And uh, new developments in, in technologies will uh, you know, potentially reduce storage costs and things like this. So it's not a static picture by any means. So, as I've said, a lot of this data exists, so maybe the need to acquire, to generate and acquire some, some more data. But I think a, a bigger challenge perhaps is, is around aggregating and, and making sense of the data. It's about bringing the data into, into a single context. If all this data is sitting in separate silos, different data models, in different applications throughout the organization, it's very hard to do anything meaning, meaningful with it. There are a number of ways that you can, you can address that, but probably the most straight, straightforward is to bring it into a, some form of investment data store, consolidate it into a single, complete, coherent re repository of, uh, of investment data. As you do that, there's a need to, to map it all, all into some, some consistent data model so that we can start to, to, to make references between, between different types of data. I think it was touched on earlier that the, the ease of integration is, is, will vary depending on, on where this data is sitting in different systems and the availability of it. You know, in an ideal world, we want, we want this investment data store populated on a near real-time basis. Now, that's, that may or may not be possible depending on the, the technology infrastructure that you, that you have in place today. Having, having aggregated the data, the next stage is, is about generating some, some insights from that data. So we have some business intelligence applications that 
out there today. I mean, they're useful to some extent. I think they're, they're often targeted more about to the, towards the enterprise than they are towards the end customer. And they're, they're often somewhat passive. They're not, they don't support ad hoc analysis. They may not support the, uh, or they almost certainly don't support the sort of event-driven alerting uh, type of business intelligence solutions that, that I think you know, organizations need, need in, the, in the modern world. So what do we need? Well, I've termed it an insight generation engine. Um, sounds like a fairly grand title, but uh, I mean, the key responsibility of, it, of this insight generation engine is to proactively generate small, timely, specific, high value targeted insights to prompt or aid a decision. It's about creating useful insights from the data for clients, for relationship managers, for the business managers. There are some capabilities needed to do that. You may need to mine large data sets. And there are some uh, emerging technologies in the world of things like big data that can probably help there. And a tool that's capable of supporting a wide range of, of, of analysis techniques. And these should be simple and fast to deploy. The idea here is that we're supporting a highly creative environment and things need to be quick to, to test out and, and, to, and to refine. And the insights need to be, be stored because it, they have value. So what are the sorts of insights that we, that we might want to generate? Well, here's just a few, a few suggestions. In terms of client-targeted insights, Investment performance, we're probably already doing some form of, uh, of basic performance measurement reporting. But there's so much more that could be done, support for ad hoc analysis, risk adjusted performance, attribution analysis, understanding where that performance has come from, allowing custom, custom grouping when, when you're analyzing performance. And we can start to personalize the experience by looking at performance directly related to, the, to the, uh, the client's investment goals. In terms of portfolio monitoring, we could allow clients to, to set exposure limits, for example, based on sector or country, or to set uh, particular uh, gain-loss targets for particular portfolios or, or individual investments, and then generate alerts when those, uh, when those limits or targets are, are hit. We could start to, to proactively deliver market information to clients based on what they've told us about their, their particular interests or, or information that's directly relevant to, to their holdings. And we could start to generate alerts based on market events. So if the client's particularly interested in a Hang Seng uh, reaching a certain level, we can alert and notify what, what, when that happens. From a relationship manager perspective, we can use that segmentation analysis to give them much greater understanding of, uh, of their client base and potentially use that to start to identify cross-selling opportunities. So if a, if a particular client segment has a, has, has a propensity to buy a certain product, but a particular client hasn't invested in that product, then we could start to prompt the relationship manager to maybe have a discussion about that. We could uh, improve the advice that the, the, the relationship manager is able to offer by analyzing a combination of market events, client goals, portfolio profile, and product features to generate really specific and targeted and, and relevant advice and timely advice. We could start to analyze the, the client's behavior. We could look for, for changes in, in investment patterns or changes in, in goals or in, even online interaction and, and, and notify the, the relationship manager of those changes, which prompt a conversation all of which can, can help them to help to deepen that relationship manager client uh, relationship and from the from an enterprise perspective we can start to do things like and you may already be doing some of this or, or already i'm sure you, i'm sure you are but perhaps do it on a more proactive basis so measure things like client profitability product profitability relationship manager profitability and identify outliers and do more event based alerting based on so rather than just supplying reams of information it's, a, it's about using the technology to identify the outliers and flag the, the, those up because those are the ones that you want you want to do do something about we can start to start to look at the efficiency of the organization look at things like relationship manager productivity or the or the return on investment from a particular marketing campaign and we can start to to monitor competitor activity and news and feed that into the system and look at the impact of, uh, of, uh, of competitor activity on on our business performance so having generated some insights, the last stage is, is about distribution, distributing those insights. And that can be through web portals, mobile channels, social media, a combination of the above. And you, know, you probably have uh, capabilities across all of those channels in, in existence today. It's, it's really about what data and what, it, what insights we, we supply down those channels. Uh, but I think there's a need to, to, to invest in the, in the distribution piece as well to keep that moving forward. There's really, there's really three levels here. There's the data, the analytics, and the distribution. And I think all three need to, need to move forward in, uh, in, in lockstep, if you like, to, to create, the, create the value. The dashboards we see there are uh, from a neighbor, by the way. In summary, it's about generating data, aggregating data, generating insights, and distributing insights from, from that data.
I don't think we're too far away. We've got a, we've got a lot of this uh, data already. There's probably more needed around aggregation to make contextualizing that data in, in, a, in a smarter way and perhaps investment in, in analytic tools to support, support the uh, analysis of that data. But it's, also, it's also about the culture aspects, about having a, a respect for, that, for, the, for the data in the organization and encouraging creativity in terms of what, what you can do with that data and the insights that can be, uh, that can be generated from it.